Chapter 10 Michael listened groggily to the beeping and the clock ticking. Right away he knew he was back at the hospital. He heaved a heavy sigh. In response, someone started strangling his arm again with the blood pressure cuff. Good morning, sleepyhead. Kelly. Michael opened his eyes and saw a dimpled smile. His tongue hurt. Welcome back. He closed his eyes. He didn't want to be back. I'll go get you some breakfast. Kelly removed the cuff. Michael must have dozed off because Kelly was back with a tray almost instantly. He ran a hand over his face and tried to remember what had happened. There was the wedding. He danced. Anne. Anne was engaged. Michael closed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose. Despair danced in his chest. Maybe they could just put him out of his misery. How about I help you sit up? Kelly used the foot pedal and the bed obeyed. I've got the walker here just in case you need to make a trip to the washroom. You're going to be very tired, so you need to call me when using the call button if you need to get up. Otherwise, we'll be picking you up off the floor. He ignored her. She could call him Cranky Pants all she wanted. He was tired and wanted the world to go away. She pushed the table over his legs. You'll feel better once you eat something. No, he wouldn't. Michael sighed and opened his eyes, dropping his hand. There was no point in arguing with Kelly. He drank the coffee and ate what he could stomach of the breakfast before pushing it away and going back to the sweet oblivion of sleep so that he could forget about Anne and her engagement to George Stapleton. Max and Paget were the first to arrive. They brought a ridiculous plant. It was small and fern-like. Michael had no idea what to do with it. He supposed Fen Lee would look after it. You scared us, Michael. Max sat on the chair and Paget perched on his leg. It seemed to be one of their favorite ways to sit. Michael waited. He didn't even know what had happened. The doctor hadn't been by yet to tell him his prognosis. Has anyone told you what happened? Paget asked. He shook his head. No. You had a seizure she explained. The doctor says you're going to be okay, but you'll be on some new medication. A seizure. Michael heaved a sigh. No wonder his tongue hurt. He'd probably bitten it when he fell. Hey, you've made our wedding the talk of the season, Max tried to lighten the mood. Michael sent them a look of apology. Paget gave her husband a look of exasperation. She leaned over and took Michael's hand. We are just glad that you're okay. Weren't they supposed to be on a honeymoon? Michael mimed the airplane with his hands. That's what trip cancellation insurance is for. We'll go later, Max said. Michael nodded. Elle and Noah came next with the twins. They both set the boys on the bed, and Michael endured their hugs and pats. Thankfully, they did not bring a plant. He wondered if it had been Paget's idea. Michael? Please do me a favor and never do that again, Elle shuddered. He couldn't promise it. He didn't remember being on the terrace. Elle filled him in on the details. Michael was sorry that he had upset her. His mother came. Rachel did not bring a plant. She did, however, get the chair from Max and Paget. They all chatted around him and he let the noise wash over him. Michael fell asleep again because they were gone when he woke up and Kelly had appeared with lunch. She followed him to the washroom. It was humiliating. Michael managed better with lunch, but his tongue still hurt. Dr. Hemmond came, pulling up the chair. Well, Michael, it's good to see you again, even if the circumstances are not what we would wish. Michael nodded. The seizure was unfortunate, but we knew it was a possibility, he said in his heavy accent. We've put you on a course of medication which should prevent further seizures once we have the levels adjusted to what your body needs. I'm also going to give you some pills that will act as a sedative. Did you feel the seizure coming on? Did you feel odd or different before the seizure happened? Michael nodded. He had felt off for most of the evening. Well, good. That means there is a chance that you will know when a seizure is coming. You can take one of the sedative pills and lie down in a dark room. This may stop a seizure from happening at all. 
We're going to keep you for the rest of today, and I expect you will sleep a lot during your stay. Tomorrow you may be discharged and go home. He looked at Michael over his glasses. No headache? Any dizziness? Michael shook his head no, and Dr. Hammond wrote his response down. Then I think, unless something changes, we should not be meeting again. Michael held out a hand, and Dr. Hammond took it. Good luck, Michael. After the doctor left, Michael slept some more. Anne looked at herself in the mirror. She was pale and washed out. She'd slept fitfully throughout the night and so decided to stay in bed until well past noon. She looked every bit her forty years. She pulled her hair back into a sloppy bun and listened to George berate her over a voicemail message. She had humiliated him, publicly embarrassed him. He railed at her lack of manners. He didn't care about her connection to the Ramsley family. He was going to sue. The engagement was over. Wait, what? What had he just said besides the vulgar language? She hit the replay button. There it was. Between her connections to the Ramsleys and suing her, he said it was in today's papers. Anne ignored the rest of the message and raced to her front door. She grabbed today's edition of her subscription newspaper off the floor from the hallway and began flipping through it. It had made the business news in the front page of the society section. There were wedding pictures someone had leaked to the press. Michael looking so handsome in his suit with his brothers. There was a picture of Anne and Michael dancing. There was her throwing off her ring as the ambulance attendants rolled Michael away on the gurney. The society page made a gossipy splash, discussing so many of the private details of their lives. Her engagement alluding to the possible twenty-year romantic relationship between her and Michael, Michael's resignation from the company. The business section merely showed Michael's photo. The brothers cropped away in a photo of her on George's arm. It discussed how Michael had stepped down now that she was the largest controlling shareholder of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. It speculated on what medical condition he might have and made a suggestive comment about why he had left all his shares to his secretary. Anne flushed red and buried her head in her hands. Michael was going to be mortified. She was mortified. It made her look mercenary at best and a slut at worst. It made him look like so many other men banging their secretaries. The only thing the paper couldn't say was that his wife had turned the other cheek since he was not married. What had David Ramsley said to her once? She'd been very young and perhaps had worked for Michael for two or three years at that point. Ah, yes. He said men who wanted to excel in their careers did not have affairs with their secretaries. He thought her crush quaint, however it would be better if she saw someone else. Anne had never liked Michael's father. David had never liked her. She knew Michael was a grown man who made multi-million dollar decisions every day, but David had still pulled the strings in the background. He did that in everyone's lives, a master puppeteer and manipulator. At the time, she'd been humiliated and simply tried to best contain her feelings. Now she wondered if he had given Michael the same talk. It didn't help that David had unsuccessfully hit on her later, insinuating she could fast-track her career if she had an affair with him. Well, the cat was out of the bag now, and even if most of it was speculation and even fabrication, there was no stuffing it back in. Anne got dressed and went to the local café. She needed something more than a regular coffee this morning. She was about to order when a woman grabbed her by the arm. "'Excuse me? It's you, isn't it?' She was excited. Anne looked at her blankly. "'Pardon me? I'm not sure what you're talking about.' The stranger held up a gossip tabloid, and there she was, throwing the ring front and center. The headline read, "'Move over, Kardashians, meet the Ramsleys.' The sub-headlines were Something Wrong with Bachelor Michael, Wild Wedding for Max, Twins for Noah, Pregnant with Another Set. At the bottom it said in bold letters, Just how long have Boss Michael and Secretary Anne been having an affair? She grabbed the paper out of the woman's hands and opened it to the inside article. Photos were splashed across the page in all their colorful glory. It detailed everything, only in a graphic, garish way. They hadn't just run with the story. It now flew with lurid suggestions and speculations. 
One paragraph inquired if Anne was sporting a baby bump and asked if she even knew who the father was. Will you sign it? The woman grabbed a pen out of her purse, holding it up. No! An aghast Anne pushed her past her and rushed out of the shop. Hey, that's my paper! Fortunately, the woman didn't follow her. Anne spotted a magazine stand and could see that this tabloid wasn't the only one that had decided they were front-page sellers. She dug her cell phone out of her purse and called L. She barely waited for the hello. L, have you seen today's papers? Max and Paget mentioned we made the Times, L replied. No one went out to buy one. Anne had a panicked laugh. She could imagine Noah when he saw the tabloids at the newspaper stands. Anne, are you okay? Max didn't think it was that bad, L said. Anne groaned. We made more than just the Times. I'm sure the journal has followed suit. You know how newspapers all print nearly the same thing. Anne could hear one of the twins babbling in the background. Ethan, let go of the phone. Sorry about that. We made the tabloids. It's lurid and trashy and is front page. Anne repeated the headline. L was silent for a moment. This isn't good. No, she couldn't bring herself to tell L about the baby bump speculation. Her phone vibrated. Jeannie's on the other line. I'll add her to our call. Anne punched in the necessary buttons. Hi, Jeannie. On my Aunt Viola's grave. Are you preggers with Michael's baby? What? L demanded. No. Anne sat down abruptly on a street bench that was meant for people waiting for the bus. An old man looked at her and kept feeding the pigeons. Then it's George's. Jeannie sounded so disappointed. There is no baby. Anne clarified. Apparently, I was just fat in the dress. The one you wore yesterday? You looked beautiful in that dress, Elle said. Yeah, well, tell it to the press. Anne had a bitter laugh. They think you're pregnant with a second set of twins. Elle was silent. Elle? Jeanie drew out her name. Is there something you'd like to share? I went to the doctor. Unexpecting. I haven't even told Noah yet. Is it twins? Jeanie gushed. It's far too early to tell that sort of thing. Besides, the chances of having twins twice is unlikely. How did they know? Elle asked, bewildered. Congratulations, Anne said. She was happy for her friend. She was sad that she had no baby bump of her own. How was Michael this morning? Good. He slept through most of our visit, but the nurses said that was normal. They expect he'll be more awake this afternoon. L was kind with her next question. Are you going to see him? Yes. Anne couldn't imagine not seeing him. Are you sure, Anne? Jeanie's voice was gentle. You'll get sucked into his life again. I love him, Anne replied simply. She was already sucked into his life. She didn't want to live without him. I'm going home to eat a pint of ice cream since I'm fat anyway. I'll let you know what I decide to do. There was a loud noise in the background of the phone. Elle's voice came through dryly. Noah's home with five tabloids and two newspapers. He looks fit to be tied. I'll call back later. Good luck, Anne said before Elle disconnected. Honey, did you really throw that ring or did they Photoshop that? Jeanie asked. Elle sighed and gave her the rundown on the entire evening. Michael flushed. He was embarrassed. He was angry. He was devastated. Anne with a baby bump? Did the math even add up? He knew nothing about when women were supposed to show. Could she be carrying George's child already? He felt sick. Kelly continued reading, perched on his bed. She'd come in all excited that he was a celebrity and that the nurses had a famous patient in their hospital. She'd teased that he was going to need security now. Then she'd sat down and proceeded to fill him in on the horror show that was his life. Noah. Noah would threaten to sue and get Deagle to get all this stuff removed and retracted. A retraction and apology on the bottom of the twelfth page in the tiniest print possible knowing the tabloid industry. Michael wondered what Anne thought of the whole business. 
Had she really thrown her ring? That was probably photoshopped. Tabloids like drama. He stared at the photos. When Max had said Michael had made the wedding the talk of the season, he understated things. It looked like they were going to be the talk of the city, whether they liked it or not. Turn on Channel 3! A nurse, he thought her name might be Dana, came charging into the room. She grabbed the remote before Kelly could and turned the television to the correct station, putting up the sound. It was one of those shows that talk about celebrities and movies. Now they were discussing the wedding and the photos in the tabloids. They had been upgraded to the talk of the nation. Everyone is speculating about what's really going on behind the public facade presented by the Ramsleys, a woman was saying. Ramsley Pharmaceuticals is one of the largest drug companies in the country, and recently Michael Ramsley made headlines when he gave his secretary all his controlling shares before leaving the company. That's right, Carol. A man now took over, and a picture of Business Weekly showed the article detailing the transfer. Brothers Max and Noah have both been in the press before, but Michael appears to have been hiding. The formal head of Ramsley Pharma is speculated to have been involved in a twenty-year-long affair with his secretary, Anne Schaefer, the same woman that he handed over a fortune in company shares to. Indeed, Tom, Carol said. However, it looks like things were not going well for the couple, as Anne had recently become engaged to George Stapleton, the dental king. But it looks like that's off. We have exclusive video of Anne throwing away her $80,000 diamond engagement ring. Tom pointed to the screen, and there it was in cell phone recorded glory. Anne pitching the ring after Noah telling her that she was engaged to George. She really had broken it off, in an incredibly public way. Michael didn't know what to think of that. We tried to reach out to George, but he's yet made no comment to the press, Carol tittered to Tom. Perhaps he's just sad that his crowning achievement has cracked his veneer? George was seen on his hands and knees searching for the diamond, Tom allowed. It's said that he used some vulgar language that wouldn't be fit for his dental commercials. Let's talk about Anne's unconfirmed baby bump, Carol gushed. I think it's Michael's. Is the baby yours? Kelly asked him. Michael shook his head. This was a train wreck. Well, at least she broke up with George, Kelly said sympathetically. Carol and Tom speculated on what kind of disease he might have and if he was dying. How could they even say this stuff on television and not worry about being sued? Michael gently took a remote from Dana and shut the television off. Noah was going to have a fit. Max couldn't have known it was this bad, otherwise he would have been angry. Their father was going to have a coronary. Michael could imagine David's rant once he found out. He'd always disliked Anne. He'd say that this entire episode had proved him right. Well, Michael had no intention of sitting through another lecture. He wasn't his father's employee anymore. Perhaps his father would stop speaking to him altogether, like he had with Max. Sadly, it would be a relief. What did Anne think? Anne, how are you? Kelly popped off off the bed and put the tabloid behind her back trying to hide the evidence of what she had been up to. Michael looked at Anne, hungry to see how she was. She looked tired and frustrated. Anne came forward and plucked the paper from Kelly's hands. She sighed, tossing it in her bag onto the chair. Please go away. She followed Kelly and Dana to the door and then shut it after them. Perching on the bed, she took Michael's hand. He drank in the sight of her. How are you doing? she asked. He gestured that he was okay. You scared us all. He nodded gravely. I'm glad you're okay. She ducked a bit of her hair behind her ear that had managed to escape the bun. He took her left hand and rubbed his thumb over her ring finger. I didn't love him, Anne shrugged and wiped away a tear. I thought maybe, given time, I can learn to, but... Michael put a hand to her cheek. Then, because he had to know, he motioned to her stomach. Anne gave a watery laugh. No, I am not pregnant. Good. He was reassured to hear that. She sniffed, so he tugged on her gently until she was resting beside him on the bed, head on his chest, his arm around her. Maybe there was a chance for him after all. He tried to say that George was an idiot. It came out 
I, June, June, George, and looked at him confused. Michael sighed, frustrated he ran a hand through his hair. It's okay, Michael. It wasn't. He stared at the ceiling. Anne sat up. Putting a hand on his cheek, she turned his head so that he looked at her. She looked so sad. Please don't be upset. I'm upset enough for both of us today. He nodded. I guess you heard all about the trash that they're printing. She pointed to the tabloid. It was worse than that. He reached over and grabbed the remote, turning on the television. On came Carol and Tom, talking about some celebrity going into rehab. Anne looked at the television to him. What's going on? He pulled her against him so that she could comfortably see the television and motion from the tabloid to the screen. They didn't, she asked in horror. In response, Tom and Carol started a repeat of the previous segment, dragging the Ramsley name through the proverbial mud. Everyone is speculating about what's really going on behind the public facade presented by the Ramsleys, Carol said. Michael let Anne watch the whole thing, her hand covering her mouth as she watched in disbelief. After it was over, he turned the power off. This is worse than I thought, Anne wiped away more tears angrily. I can't believe they just talked about us like that. He rubbed her back. Part of him was angry at these people who thought they could just speculate on the lives of others. Another part of him was grateful. Anne wasn't engaged or pregnant. What did it mean, though? The door opened with Noah and Elle coming in. Kelly rolled her eyes from the hall and mouthed sorry to Michael and Anne. Noah leaned against the wall, arms folded, while Elle took the chair. Where are the twins? Anne asked. I left them with my mama. It seemed like the best idea. El looked at Noah. He thinks we should sue. Michael sighed. They could sue, but would they win? If they won, would it be worth it? If the retraction would be lousy? If they lost, it would add more fuel to the fire. The truth was, the majority of what was printed were... Mm, close to facts. What was pure speculation would be hard to prove was libelous. I know what you're going to say. Noah stated flatly that there is no use in suing them unless we can win, and we probably won't. The court will likely throw out the case or rule in favor of those trash tabloids like they've done in the past. Michael looked at Noah wryly. There really was no point in suing. They can just get away with it? Anne asked. They can print and say whatever they like on television just to get more readers and viewers. On television? El inquired. We've made the entertainment news. Anne said angrily. You're kidding. Al looked at Noah, who visibly reigned in his temper. We can do a press release, an interview, and present our side. Make them look like cads, Noah said darkly. It's about the only thing we can do. I probably still have the name and numbers of the columnists from the GQ and Business Weekly, Anne offered. They've been trying to get Michael to sit down for an interview for years. If you'll contact them, it will be a start. They're both reputable magazines. We can give a press release to the other magazines we choose. Do you want to do the interview? Anne asked Michael. We need to do this, Noah interrupted. The company's reputation has suffered. This could affect the Claymore purchase. We need to present a united front as a family. That means all of us together. Although how we're going to get Dad and Max in the same room is beyond me. Is there any way that your father would forgive Max? El questioned. If Max were to apologize, grovel and admit he was wrong, which he will never do because he was right, Noah said in disgust. The old man can't forgive anyone. Michael grimaced. He could make it happen. He didn't want to do it, but he had a trump card when it came to their father. While David had hired private investigators to monitor his children's lives and a few more people besides... Michael had hired someone to investigate his father. The result had been earth-shaking. He had only confronted his father once about what he had found out when it was in desperate situation. He would rather keep the secret to himself. He didn't want to burden his brothers with it. It was better to forget what he knew. Forget, Dad. We can do it without him. He's too much of a headache to deal with. We should set up the interview for as soon as possible. You get released tomorrow. Would that be too much for you? Noah asked. Are you sure that you want to do this? 
Anne queried softly of Michael. He nodded. It needed to be done, plus it wasn't like he could answer any questions anyways. He was relieved that Noah seemed to be taking control of the situation. I still think we should give it a couple days for Michael to be rested enough. I'm sure the colonists will appreciate the time to run the whole interview idea past their editors, and they'll want to make up a list of questions for us to look at, Anne said. At least the last time they wanted to interview, they were willing to be limited to a list of questions. That may have changed. We'll find out when you contact them, Elle said. In the meanwhile, I'm going to see what trouble the twins have gotten into. I suggest we all leave and let Michael get some rest. He's going to need it for the rest of the interview. Michael agreed. He was feeling fatigue creep up on him. Anne grabbed her purse. I'll come back tomorrow with Max, and we'll get you settled at the beach house again. Michael nodded. He was glad to have Anne back in his life again. He'd try to figure out a way to make her happy, he reflected drowsily as she left. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Words Unspoken. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.